What's up, everybody? Uh, how are you doing today? A little stuffy. Uh, I am, personally, but uh, that's all good, you know, happens. Got my new, fresh, funky cami sweater. Check out the shop, link in bio. And today, I'm gonna be live with Spike the Chef. And Spike is a, obviously a chef. He's a loves mushrooms. He's a founder of the Plant Burger. He's the Food City Council of DC, somewhere in. And um, not many of you know this, but I actually had a little part of my life where I was a chef as well. I'm still a chef. I love cooking, but I don't do it professionally anymore. So I'm super stoked that we can add, finally talk on this Instagram Live Shabam with uh, somebody that also loves cooking. So I'm just going to invite Spy. Uh, what up, what up? Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me and see me? Yes, I can hear you and I can see you right now. You're sideways and now you're back straight. Good. P perfect. Nice, man. How are you doing? doing Is that good. an Amadou hat? Pardon? Is that an Amadou hat? Yes. Like from it from Adaris. Nice, that, man. That, that's right. Fantastic. If, if Paul Stamets is doing it, you should be too. I know, I know. They just don't grow natively here in Guatemala. So next time I'm in Europe, I'll yeah. find somebody that I, will be I, able to make I, me hat. I got to hit up your link in your bio and get one of those sweet sweatshirts, though. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're, like, super comfy. It's, like, rainy season now. So, every, like, yeah, most days are cloudy, which makes me feel like home. <laughs> so good sweater weather. Awesome. Hey, oh. Thanks so much for taking the time to be uh, – like one of the Instagram Live guests. And uh, I just did a short introduction of who you are. And for the people that are just came in a little bit later, can you give us a little intro to who is Spike the Chef and what you're all about and why do you love mushrooms? Absolutely. So I am Spike the Chef. I'm in the DMB, uh, which we refer to. It's basically the D.C. area. Uh, but we got Maryland and Virginia that surround us, so we always refer to it as to the DMB. I'm originally from Montreal. Uh, Canadian boy, um, grew up in the restaurant industry, uh, huge passion for food and where it comes from. Um, you know, I traveled uh, all over Europe to get some training. I worked in the north of France where I, I first really uh, did uh, discover my love of mushrooms. Uh, I was at, you know, at a, uh, um, a, a Relay and Chateau, if you will, in the north of Champagne and a three Michelin star restaurant. And I was the, the guy, the, I was the only American in about 30, 30, group of chefs um and uh can you just close that door for me all right we got we're in the office live today so so uh, uh um but yeah so you know in france i grew i i would have to one of the jobs i had to do because i was at the bottom of the totem pole there is i had to wake up at six in the morning and receive all the ingredients for the chateau so this is where i got to meet a lot of the purveyors and stuff so i, I got to accept these beautiful seps and pounds and pounds of black truffles from Perigo, which I, I could tell you were just like insane, right? We did we did everything with them. We we actually had a truffle menu that every course had a truffle on it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm classically trained uh, from uh, uh, from you know the French. I in New York, I started working at some big French restaurants as well when I finally kind of graduated from school, and and um, and then I fell in love with Vietnamese cuisine. Uh, I just love how. It, you know, the cuisine had a lot of French classical techniques, you know, for those who don't know, the French had colonized Vietnam back in the day. While they were there, they were showing him all sorts of things about the cuisine. So like pho, it didn't exist. It was derived from, uh, you know, a classic dish called pot au feu, which is a one pot cookery of, of soup. Crepes, they weren't making crepes until the French got there. Banh mi sandwiches, baguettes and pâtés and all that stuff. So Fell in love with Vietnamese food, uh, opened a couple of Vietnamese restaurants. Um, finally, lots of stuff in and between of all that, but I ended up in D.C., which uh, this is the longest place I think I've ever lived since, uh, you know, uh, being in Montreal. I, I, I call it kind of home. You know, I, I love it here. Uh, we we uh, just opened up two new startup concepts. Uh, one's called Planet Burger, which is an indulgent, delicious um, plant-based burger restaurant, no, soy-free, kosher, uh, no GMOs, uh, super delicious. We have a lot of fungi involved on the menu, one which we could in particular talk about. And then uh, the other uh, startup is Eat the Chains. It's a, it's a CPG company. And uh, basically we're, um, you know, we're snack snackification and climate change and e 
eco anxiety meet because eco anxiety is a real thing, right? Yeah. That's where we like to conquer. We're developing snacks that are chef crafted and planet based, so they're delicious and good for you, but also good for the planet. So um, one of the interesting things before I give it back to you is like for Eat the Change. Uh, well, our first product line was mushroom jerky. Uh -huh. Right. We have five different SKUs. I'll, I'll get the other ones in a little bit, but um, you know I have guardrails. So. You know, 60% of the food that we eat are produced by only six crops, six crops, right? Soy, cane sugar, wheat, rice, potatoes. Um, and there's 590 other thousand other crops that you can use to make delicious food with. So we choose to use those uh, and to support biodiversity. And, you know, we love mushrooms as our first uh, ingredient because they're the, you know, they're definitely the most sustainable crop to grow right with the water and, and how they grow uh and they're absolutely delicious and good for you so big fan exactly. wow amazing like it's, it seems like you do a lot for just one individual you know several restaurants uh food activists and all these things and what i'm very like interested in is like you have your first experiences like you really love first mushroom experiences in this chateau in the north of champagne and uh like how has that like change from like, did you go foraging for your own mushrooms or is like, did you meet some other foragers that then would give you the mushrooms? And like, how do you um, feel and taste the difference of like wildly crafted mushrooms and uh, cultivated mushrooms? Absolutely, absolutely. So when I was accepting these truffles in, in, uh, in the north of France and seps and a, a, a lot of other different variety of mushrooms, all right, as chanterelles, um, they were uh, from mush mushroom foragers. So they weren't from like a company or anything else. It was, that's what was so special about it and so memorable that it was just, you know, these small holder forager farmers that would come to deliver whatever they, 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 they you know, they, they were able to forage that day. Sometimes they had a big forage, sometimes they didn't. Lots of morels also, by the way, during the season over there. So I, I would uh, eventually after, you know, getting trust of the kitchen and doing my job correctly and, you know, I was, like I said, I was at the bottom of the totem pole there, which was great because there's only, you know, you can only climb up. But, uh, um, and eventually the French, they just accepted me and, and loved me and I loved them back and they showed me everything. So I, I, that was a very good part of my life. But, but I was, a, uh, you know, I was invited on some morel hunts. I didn't get the truffle ones, right? The truffle hunt, because that's out in Perigo, Perigo. But I was able to go hunting and foraging for, uh, for morels. I, I remember finding some chanterelles there as, uh, as well. And, I, I think apart from like neuroscience, like foraging your own mushrooms are way better and taste more delicious than buying mushrooms at a, at a supermarket, right? But there's something about uh, mushrooms that are, are widely foraged that are, there's a little bit earthier and there's a more punch of, a more pungent flavor and complexity uh, in the mushrooms. And when you're buying mushrooms that are grown, for, for instance, we get our mushrooms here from Canada Square, uh, which is the mushroom capital of the world, right? Um, and they're very clean. They taste very clean. They're less, um, they have less of that, that earth taste. And we use portobellos and creminis for the mushroom jerky. Uh, but you know, they're constantly flushing the mushrooms with moisture and water and it's very clean. There's a good amount of vitamin D in there also because they, they do the, the, the lighting. But, but yeah, that's, that's, you know, I actually found my first, um, Pom pom, the, my my first lines made uh, a couple weeks ago, and nice. I I mean I was the happiest person in the world. Like I couldn't believe it. Uh, I, I was like foraging with you know with no real certain intent, and I saw like these bunny ears like of like you know in the distance, and I was like, oh no, this can't be possible, right? And I was like, I ran towards it, and sure enough, they were these li beautiful lines made right off of this fresh log, and um, you know I cooked those up, and they were delicious. So. Yeah, man. I feel like mushrooms are, are slowly getting the popularity that they deserve, especially like flavor wise. I often like yesterday I was at a podlock and I uh, just like harvested some of the oyster mushrooms we grow at Fungi Academy. And I just made like a oyster mushroom pate uh, with like uh, lots of nutritional yeast. So it's like this cheesy kind of pate, but like chunks in there still. So it's kind of like a, a oh, yeah. almost like a real pate. And it just like blows everybody's mind because I also added like uh, some lion's mane extract of powder that we have. And it's just like pure umami. And it feels like umami is just um, it is the forgotten flavor in many, many ways. Totally, you know? totally. So like if the whole, everybody brought like sweet and salt and soury and stuff. And then like one dish with umami, it just like, 
because <laughs> we're just not used to it. So like it really, yeah. it's really noticeable for me that like I ate so many mushrooms that it's not, it's not that like oh my god, uh, right? No, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. my mind because right. I, I I'm more used to that flavor palette. And you, when you mentioned like there's one mushroom in particular with Planet Burger, I like I'm not exactly oh, clear yeah. which restaurant that was. So, yeah, so so Planet Burger, so. So what happened is we were using, uh, we had a mushroom bacon burger on our menu and we were using nice. shiitake mushrooms to make bacon, uh, you know, bacon profiles and, and, and so forth. So, you know, as a chef, you know, and you know, you said you're a chef, you, you always want to visit the source, you're a farmer, you're growing mushrooms, right? So you always want to visit the farm and the source and kind of, you know, see what's there. So we took a visit to Kenneth Square Park and we got this beautiful tour by uh, the local mycologist there. And, uh, they were taking us from room to room and we we arrived to this yellow oyster and you got to try this by the way if you're growing oyster mushrooms we got to this yellow oyster mushroom room and you see the beautiful oysters just kind of sprouting off right the, off the pouch and they're harvesting them and tina which is the lady the mycologist farmer there uh she says oh sometimes i take this bulb right so when you grow oysters they're growing kind of out of this fruiting body if you will you, you know i don't have to tell you like it's kind of like the roots um yeah. and it's a big white bulb and she's like, oh, sometimes I take this home and chop it up and cook it because it tastes like chicken. And I was like, wait, what? She's like, yeah. I was like, what do you do with these? She's like, oh, we just compost them or sometimes throw throw them away. There's real no market for them. I was like, but you take them home? And, and she's like, yeah, I, I take them home. I was like, can I get a case of those? And she's like, absolutely. So we took a case and we brought them back. We steamed them. We tenderized them. We sliced them. We spiced them. And then we uh, kind of gave them like a little sear. And then we flash fry them like in a batter. And honest to God, Ooh. the best fried chicken sandwich on the face of the planet. It, it, it ah. is, it tears, the texture tears exactly like, you know, chicken doesn't have too much flavor, right? It takes on to flavor. So this is exactly what the fruiting body does. It takes, takes on to whatever flavor you incorporate in it. It fries really well. And then it tears just like, just like chicken. So if you're uh, a, you know, if you're a fried chicken guy and you want to go plant-based, we have an item at Planet Burger that is out of this world. And, you know, and then it took off. We had to come out with a spicy version. Now we have a barbecue version. But it, nice. it's really led us to a lot of innovation in, in, in the space because, you know, after we figured that out, we're like, oh, what else can we make, right? So we're, we consider ourselves very much like the fast food plant-based burger restaurant. So when we're looking at things like, you know, like a McRib sandwich on a McDonald's menu that people love that, right? Like, how do we make that? Well, you know, the other day we were able to make it. We took some of this fruiting body of the, the, the mushroom. We took this uh, texturized, fermented texturized protein that comes from uh, shiitake mycelium. Oh, and we, cool. Yeah, and we mixed the bo uh, both, and we made this mold with, uh, like, a riblet mold. And we actually made this plant-based shiitake mycelium uh, fruiting body uh, um, sandwich, and it was out of this world. So, I mean, you know, it, we're just at the tipping point of, of – of discovering mushrooms, not only in the culinary space, like going above and beyond just bun mushrooms and portobellos, really getting into the exotic ones like the maitakis, the king oysters, the pom poms, uh, and using them in recipes. So that's that's kind of what my gig is these days. I, I try to use mushrooms any way I can, and and I'm, I'm been really, you know, I've been fascinated about by the process and, you know, how interesting mushrooms. I just read this this book all about you know, the wood wide web, right? And I watched fantastic. Oh, it's, uh, the Funny the Mother Tree by Suzanne Simmons. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Fantastic book. I just, you know, watched Fantastic Guy, a fun guy a couple months ago. Loved it. You know, like, it, it, you know, all these things are just continually inspiring me. And and now that you're, you're, you're woke into the mushroom world, they pop up everywhere, don't they? Like, they're just, they're just popping up everywhere, so. Yeah. So actually, to turn back a little bit, also like the, the idea of the what you call the the end of the mushroom mushrooms. Uh, it's called the the technical term in, for most mushroom cultivators is the stem bud. And actually, the that's stem why king oysters are so popular because it's the same texture as the king oyster, right? So if you have exactly. like a stem bud of like your big cluster of oyster mushrooms, yeah. but uh, making a fried chicken sandwich is like genius. I just like yeah. fry them and make like little things, but I. I uh, because that's already super tasty. But like, what I see a lot of people do wrong in cooking mushrooms is that they try to 
act like it's meat, right? So I think what you mentioned before is really important. You want to steam it or you want to at least suck out all the moisture, right? Because mu mushrooms are like 90% water. And most of the time, you just want to like get all the water out of the mushrooms first before you add oil. And maybe some people notice and have had this, you add oil to the pan, you add mushrooms, all the oil is gone. You add more oil, all the oil is gone. And that is because of the water content. So make sure that your mushrooms are have as little water content in it before you really start using them as a, a culinary tool. I, I love what you just said because um, I often thought I was the only one doing this, but now it might it might just be you and me. But 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 uh, <laughs> you know uh, you're right. Like the mushrooms, especially in restaurants, like in my kitchen, like when I was working with portobellos or you know ch you know uh, creminis or buttons, they have about ninety five percent moisture, right? Uh, give or take a couple percentages, right? So you're exactly right, you know, so what I what I always taught people in my kitchen, and I might have learned this in France, I don't know, along the way, but I throw my mushrooms in a dry pan, I put the heat very moderate to get them going, like you said, and then they're gonna start to leach out all this water, and it, it will be, you will find it amazing on how much water comes out of all these mushrooms, right? And then, then usually what I do is I drain that, I cast that water off, right? I drain, I don't really reduce if I'm making a soup, I might reduce it and use it as stock, but I usually cast cast it off. Then I add oil and saute if I'm trying to do a saute mushroom. And that's how you get a really nice caramelized, delicious mushroom that is crispy and, and, and seared instead of, um, you know, squeaky and, and soggy, right, sometimes. Yeah. So I, I love that point, that cooking technique that you just mentioned. And by the way, that broth that you, you leach off, there's a ton of great nutrients in that. So, so we, you know, I, I do little mushroom shots here throughout the day mm -hmm. with, with that, so. That's nice. I, I, li I like to cook in cast irons. And what I like to do is like, I just let it evaporate and then you can scrape off like the residue and then that creates a really nice adding to any dressing or sauce you make because it's like that pure umami, but it's also all the, the powerful polysaccharides that kind of leach out in some of the water. Wow. Like, I feel like I could talk about totally just the, 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 the cooking aspect. And like, so what, like for anybody that like, a lot of people grow up, right, and saying like, oh, I don't like mushrooms because they get horribly cooked butter mushrooms, which are like definitely not the most interesting taste. What would be the number one mushroom that you recommend to somebody that like loves the concept of mushrooms, but has like this, this thing of the past of like, I don't like mushrooms? Yeah, I would, I would, I would shoot straight for a grilled maitake mushroom, maitake Ooh. mushroom on, on the grill. Like I think for me, for the, you know, some of the folks that are not sure about mushrooms, uh, but they do like steakier flavors and textures, like the maitake, if you do a whole roast or grill and you get the outside, and you do a nice marinade, right? And you get the outside nice and crispy and the, and the roots are a little bit more, their stems are a little bit more uh, tender. To me, that's just like such a delicious bite. You get that crispy, you know, umami punch and texture, and then you get that nice juice. I, uh, mm. And uh, to me, those are favorite. I did some over the weekend. We had a company retreat, and it was um, well, not over the weekend, a couple weeks ago. And we went uh, foraging for ramps because it was ramp season for just about two weeks here. And we made a ramp pesto, and we brought my tack, uh, my my takis and king mushrooms with us on the trip. And we made these uh, mushroom skewers, and the my takis by far were the best to me. Uh, we just you know put a little bit of this this pesto, this ramp pesto on top of them, out of this world. Wow, that's yeah. Don't start with the button mushroom. Do, do no. not go to the button mushroom, everybody. It's like one of my most disliked vegan options for burgers is the full on portobello burger. It's like this yeah. is the most lazy, way lazy, to make lazy. <laughs> this is great. So, um, are there any mushrooms that right now are not really? Um, like popular because like my take is also coming up in popularity, right? And there's a basically only 10, 12 mushrooms that are really widely cultivated around the world for gourmet purposes. Are there any on your radar that you think are coming up? Yeah, I mean, I, I've enjoyed messing around with these different varieties of uh, oysters, you know, like I've been enjoying, especially the yellow oysters. I, I thought that, that those are really great. I still think shiitakes don't get I, I shiitakes get a bad rap. I, I don't I still don't think they're widely accepted like like the other mushrooms. Fresh shiitakes is quite an essential. It's such a difference. Totally difference. Exactly. Like you know you you can buy some of this 
you know, I have a ton of stuff. You can buy some of these dried shiitake mushrooms uh, that come from China. Not great, right? Totally different flavor. I, I have them in here just to compare to fresh shiitakes. Uh, um, but then if you get a really nice organic shiitake, you know, mushroom makes a world of difference. And if it's fresh, uh, you know, especially, especially so. So, uh, well, I mean, what do you think? You're, you, what's out there? You tell me what, 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 yeah. Which of, yeah. I think the next one that's really going to take everybody over, especially like for people that like plant-based uh, kind of foods, uh, is the beefsteak fungus of the, the genus uh, Pistulina. I don't know if you're familiar. The, like some people are right now kind of figuring out how to cultivate them on a larger scale. Um, they, they look like a beefsteak. So if you squeeze them when they're like nice, they kind of have like that bloody juice come out of them. And it's only one of the few mushrooms that like, People uh, really enjoy eating raw as well, but it's uh, it's very tasty and yeah. it's like the texture is more like meats than anything any other mushroom in my opinion, and it is possible to cultivate. I also yeah. think that uh, the uh, the wood ears and uh, the Judas ears, however you want to call them, uh, are like really ramping up because you can fry them into these crispy bacon parts and they just go so well in soups and they're actually also me super medicinal. Very easy to cultivate on a large scale. They actually grow really easily, like all over. And um, I really, I really believe that those two are the ones that are moving in next because they're just like, they're just so different, right? Like the texture of so many mushrooms is still very similar. Like like portobello and shiitake texture, flavor is completely different. Texture can be quite, quite similar. Most oysters are similar. Um, but these are so radically different that I really see them, especially coming up in the, the more like fancy, like fungal focused restaurants. Mm. I, I really hope to see more of uh, these, these two. And like, we, we still have so much to learn from the East, right? From what they're actually eating in, in China. And they're also cultivating so much more. And I've never been and like, I would really explore, want to explore China when the world opens up a bit, a bit again and like really see like potential and like what we can bring back as a staple for food here in the West. And Go back a little bit on Vietnamese cuisine because I spent quite some time in Vietnam as well, and that's where really my uh, my love for cooking and food came to light oh, together with Thailand. Um, but I actually I'm very surprised because they have so many influences of the of China in the culture and the country, but actually I don't remember so many people cooking with mushrooms there. Do yeah, you have, yeah. like do you think do you know what, what? it is? Maybe the French that were like kind of microphobic in that area. Well, I think it just has to deal with – well, in Vietnam, what I, what I learned, and, and I'm so happy to know that you went because I have to say it's one of the highlights of my life is traveling throughout Vietnam, the markets, tasting all the food. I actually the opened smell, up eating, dude. The I smells. can still drink the smells. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's nothing better than waking up at 6.30 in the morning and starting your day off with a pho and then a banh mi sandwich and then a Vietnamese coffee before, like, 10.30. It's, and then you're going for dumplings somewhere else. I mean, it's, it's the best, right? So – you know, I have a love of Vietnam big time. I opened up a couple of Vietnamese restaurants in New York uh, shortly after my trip there. And, um, you know, king mushrooms were probably the most wildly, uh, you know, used. The wood ear dried ones are used a lot in for spring rolls and the chop up in crepes and to do in stir fries as well. But you're right. I didn't see a, a much variety of mushrooms. What I do know about the cuisine, though, and uh, as you do, is that Everything stays very fresh to the last minute in Vietnam. They have very limited amount of refrigeration. So when you go out to these wet markets, they're called wet markets mostly because everything's really still alive, right, or swimming or flopping and, you know, so forth. And I just don't think they have a big, huge mushroom uh, food economy over there. I just don't think there's, like, a demand for it. And, um, you know, we should we should. It's very interesting, through. right, because, like, in yeah. all the places in the world, it seems that cordyceps cultivation is becoming really – popular there as for a way that like people can like grow to basically grow themselves out of poverty because they can sell it for so much money to like either China or the Chinese people living in Vietnam. Yeah. And I also really think that that's an underappreciated culinary mushroom. It's really seen as a, uh, as a basically medicinal mushroom. Yeah. But the, 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 the shape and the colors, they're so vibrant. I think um, William Petita Brown, also known as Michael Symbio, check him out on Instagram. He grows a lot, and he calls them space Cheetos, alien space, space Cheetos. Cheetos. <laughs> <laughs> like, if you cook them, they stay that really nice, vibrant orange. And that's yeah. just something that you don't really, like maybe with carrots, but like we're so used to carrots that we don't think it's that special anymore. But like it's yeah. not something you see a lot either in 
It's the same what I really appreciate about cooking pink oyster mushrooms. They stay that yeah. very nice, vibrant pink. And, you know, what else can you cook that, ha like, that has that super vibrant pink color? I, like, when I do it, like, we have a lot of edible pink flowers here. So uh, when yeah. I make a pizza plate, I actually, like, use those, those edible flowers. But, like, I, I think I, I color on my... the plate is so important. I grew pink oysters last season, my first time. Nice. Uh, and they came out pretty well. Uh, some came more vibrant pink than others. Some were a little bit lighter. I, I, don't, I don't know what happened there, but they were, they were quite beautiful and they maintained their, uh, their, uh, their, um, their color. I saw a question come up here in the thing and I, I was curious as well what you thought about this, but like someone said you're not supposed to eat fresh mushrooms, which I, I, I feel like I totally disagree with. And okay, I feel yeah. like, I mean, I think there are, you know, I think there's some dishes in some restaurants where they really thinly shave the mushroom and like a little olive oil, salt, pepper, and some things, and that's it. And that's like the dish. But, um, you know, I don't see anything wrong with eating eating uh, raw oysters. I mean, raw oysters, raw mushrooms. Um, there's a couple of things. Yeah. Uh, if, the, if your body is okay with it, it's probably fine. But yeah. there's, in large amount, it's almost not good for anybody because it contains so much chitin, which is the same um, compound that like exoskeletons of insects are made out of. And we can not digest that. So it just hurts in our stomach. There's also lots of, mu most mushrooms have compounds that are so-called mycotoxins, which mm. uh, are break down really easily on a little bit of heat, but not so that like, so if you eat them raw, you get more of those into your system as well. So for example, there's uh, the chicken of the woods, super like popular, uh, super tasty mushroom that if you don't cook it properly, um, and even people that cook it properly, like have really big issues digesting it because it has some of these mycotoxins that do not break down on high, uh, high levels of heat. I mean, kind of have to get accustomed to the mushroom. So most times when you eat a new mushroom, I recommend to everybody just eat a little bit of it so uh, your body can get accustomed to it. And I see a, a question on like mushroom ceviche. So actually with mushroom ceviche, you do break down and the chitin and some of these mycotoxins just by the pure acidity of the, the concoction. But like you have to let it sit for a little bit longer than what you do, for example, with uh, yeah. a shrimp or uh, some like really nice uh, uh, silver trout or something that just like kind of Ooh. butters out, you know? Yeah. But I, I see you on, on mushroom ceviche, but I raise you mushroom kraut. What? Mushroom kraut, yeah. Yeah. Right? Don't you like that idea? Sure. Like, I, I've been thinking about making, you know, using the, the way of, of uh, you know, kimchi, some, some type of kimchi technique to, instead of to cabbage, to mushrooms, because I thought, I think that would be super killer, right? I haven't you know, seen... It's a classic Russian thing to do, fermented mushrooms. Yeah, because they, they harvest mushrooms in the fall, and then, like, they have, they, there are so many mushrooms that they have to do something that like so they stay well for all the winter so they make a uh, mushroom sauerkraut mushroom sauerkraut i like it yeah. okay okay you need to send yeah. me a recipe Again, if I, you got one yeah well I, I can ask my uh my my russian friend if she has a recipe but like most like for me as well fermentation is so much more of an art than it is a, a science because like i i love playing with it and i actually see um and I, this is what i teach a lot is like the mushrooms the fungi are actually the fermenters of the of the planet, right? So they break down this the food for other organisms, so it's more bioavailable and it's probably mm. more tasty and delicious. And that's what's happening in the fermentation process, right? We are, we're acting on like lactobacilli and yeast to start breaking down these or, like these chemical structures of the food, so it, like it's easier for us to absorb. But it also alchemizes actually the flavor and the the whole the whole palate of the the dish, and also. That's why in all fermentation, fungi are involved, you know? It's like bread, beer, wine, um, even like in sauerkraut, yeasts get in there and they, they eat that, the, they eat all the good stuff. And I love it. Yeah. Mushrooms rule the planet, don't they? They really they, do. Well, <laughs> they are basically the, the, the foundation of life on the planet, right? Yes. Like, yeah. uh, they're not on top, but like they, they make sure if the, you take the foundation off, everything on top just collapses. It so, just collapses. I yeah. love it. I love it. Yeah, man. And like, what I'm also interested in is how much more we can learn not only of fruiting bodies and not only of working with these microorganisms, but also of the mycelium, right? Mm. I love tempeh. I spent a lot of time in Indonesia. I spent a lot of time cooking with Indonesian ladies and like how they 
grow tempeh that easily in that environment, I'm always surprised because I, it's not, for me, as a mushroom cultivator, I've tried to grow, grow tempeh, not from like a starter kit, which is made in a laboratory, but really try to grow my own starter kit. And it was so much harder. And I just remember in Indonesia, they just put like a leaf with soybeans outside. And they use this very specific hibiscus leaf where this fungus of the tempeh uh, is like endogenous on. Wow, the, the, the Latin name just like slips me, but that's okay. But like okay. right now, for example, there's mycelium, bacon, and like all these totally. other things. What, what do you see as a, a, how do you, how are you inspired to cook more with mycelium in this kind of way? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think we, we touched on it just a little bit, but, but, uh, you know, I've, um, ever since entering the plant-based movement and, you know, having, you know, being a chef that, you know, has some businesses, I've been getting sent a lot of these products. So like these mycelium bacons you're talking about, I, I, I got the, taste a lot of them and i don't think we're quite there on, on the mycelium bacon yet i haven't i don't know if you you had something uh you know uh yet that really screams to you but but what like i said you know working with a group like myco uh technology where they take the mycelium and they ferment it and they take turn it into this texturized protein you can make uh like basically um myco chorizo or a burger out of this a meatball uh, we've, we've had a lot of fun with this ferment texture, texturized protein, and we're using it for Planet Burger for innovation, uh, on our menu. And, and, you know, uh, so that's kind of, kind of the fun I've been having with it. So, uh, and again, like, you know, I, I, I'm up to, you know, following the path and seeing how far it goes. Like I, you know, it could be mycelium fermented vinegar, or, you know, I'm looking even at making pizza dough with this stuff somehow. Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, just, you know, the ultimate mushroom pizza, the shroom pie, or, so for me, you know, that's kind of what, wake, you know, gets me going when I wake up in the morning is that, you know, there's a ton of innovation. And that's what's so cool about the moment in time right now. We're seeing a huge shift in our food system, right? Um, you know, a lot of it's planet ba uh, plant-based, but we like to refer to our company as planet-based because, you know, mushrooms aren't plants at all, right? So, so for, for us, we want to encompass all of it, but there's a huge shift happening in our food system, and it is more planet-based. It is more mushrooms, and it's a lot more of these things and less and less of, of animal meat. And, you know, I'm a flexitarian, so I'm by no means 100% vegan or vegetarian, but I, my diet lately has been much, much more like 85% veggies and and i pick my occasions when i want to eat animal protein special and it's kind of a celebratory moment for me where where i eat something where i know where it's grown it's sustainable and, and things of that sort so yeah Dude, i cannot agree more and like thank you for bringing up that yeah my, i always get, feel like when people are talking about also in psychedelics like sacred plant medicines like well you, you eat like the sacred mushroom right that's not a plant and when people say are plant-based i always think it's like well to an extent, but you're not a plant. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like in, in Dutch, people say like I'm. Uh, well, like it roughly translates. It's like I eat ve vegetarian, uh, but like, when you say I am vegetarian, it actually technically means that you are a plant as well, which is a funny thing of like how people also connect some of their identity to what they eat. And uh, yeah. for a long time, I actually ate vegetarian. Um, but then right now, I'm living in such a remote area, and I'm surrounded by permaculture farms, and they have amazing like wild chicken that I that literally grows up uh, next to the street like in the same street and like you said it really becomes this beautiful rich almost ritualistic like I have so much gratitude when I eat the animal protein but what I do in incorporate more and more in my life is the the actually the bones and the organs because they, they they butcher so many chickens that they have so much bones and like yeah they can do some stuff with it themselves but often they either give it away or like we, we trade it for some mushrooms and uh, I've really and enjoy incorporating them and especially chicken bone broth with oyster mushrooms it's like it's it's you feel all the nourishment just going in and that's that's like to me it's really powerful especially coming from uh, a very much uh planet-based uh diet in for a while and that's a tough one to change right that narrative that like it, wording of plant based and it, uh it thank is you, plant it's, medicine. it's definitely it, i think it's tough to change but i think the term plant-based is getting so overused that I, I you know, it's kind of like where organic was or sustainable, you, you know? So I, I'm enjoying the shift to trying to, you know, I think we're part of it. We're pushing it. We're pushing the narrative of planet-based, right? You know, because the other part of this is that, you know, the whole world would not be vegan or vegetarian, right? But our first, our food system's definitely like 
not not balanced the way it should be. And and fungi can take a huge part of that, right? If people incorporate a lot more mushrooms to their diet, eat a lot more plants. And I'm not the guy that says let's eliminate all animal protein. But what you just said, right? Living in an area with permaculture culture and farms and like you know where your food comes from that is the narrative we want to keep pushing we want to do less manufacturing and big huge monopolized farm growing right we want to get away from that that's that's where we're pointing the finger to because that's really creating the carbon emissions and you know affecting climate change and all that the sustainable farming is something that i think should should we should we should uh you know hold up and celebrate right with the farmers that are going the extra mile to grow their, their, their animals like that. So to me, it's all about balance in life. You know, I'm not saying one way or the other. That's what I've really enjoyed about my own diet. I feel like I'm pretty healthy. I have great energy. I feel like I'm sharp when I want to be at work, right? And, you know, I have my lazy, lackadaisical days. But for the most part, I feel pretty healthy human being. And I, I, I attribute that to not being so one way or the other. Like, I, I try to really break out the balance but in the last two years, my uptake in mushrooms, not only just eating mushrooms, you know, for tests, but like even like the reishi and, and, and chaga and the coffee and the tea, getting it wherever I can get it at certain parts of the day it has vastly improved my, my life, I feel. And I feel like it's made me a lot sharper. And, and um, you know, that's why I love it. And that's why, you know, if I can, I'll tell you a little bit about our mushroom jerky if you want. Have you tasted this? Yeah. Did we get some to you yet? Not yet, no. All right, we will ship some to you. Awesome. I, yeah, I, I hope it. Uh, I wonder if we could do. Where Where are you? Where I'm are in you Guatemala, going? but like it's probably best if you send it to my, some friends or something that come that, here because Guatemala doesn't have a postal service. Yeah. So, anyways, <laughs> look, make sure we get that. Send me that on Instagram later because I want to send you a batch. Uh, awesome. But we have these. Um, so what we did is is just to tell you about eat the change a little bit, right? So. Uh, uh, we opened up Planet Burger and we came up with a, such a good slogan from Gandhi, uh, our marketing director, uh, eat the change you wish to see in the world. We thought that was just such a powerful thing and we loved it so much that we broke it off and, and opened up another startup company uh, called Eat the Change. And it's our CPG company, right? And we just launched the mushroom jerky. Uh, and I told you what our guardrails w w are there, right? We, we, we don't use you know, potatoes or cane sugar or any of that kind of stuff, right? It's all about biodiversity. But the other cool thing is that at the mushroom bar, they have these mushrooms that are called cast-offs, right? The ones that are like, you know, as you know, like the, the stems are a little bit too thick or they're ugly or they're blemished. They don't make it to market. So we rescue all those, and that's what we use for our company. Uh, we use a blend of carminis and mushrooms. And then, you know, we're chef-crafted and planet-based, so the craft has to come in place. So we actually take these mushrooms, right, and they're organic, fresh mushrooms, and we go to a smokehouse. And we, sm we marinate our mushrooms and then we smoke them with real hickory wood, right? So this isn't any like smoke flavor or liquid smoke. These are real hickory wood from trees that have been, have fallen. We don't cut down trees, right? Or trees from furniture making, for instance. And I kind of dig the fact that we use a tree wood to flavor the mushroom, right? There's something in combination from where the, how the mushroom grows in the earth and it, the interconnecting web to the trees and the plants that we actually use it as a flavoring. I really dig that, uh, that part. And then we dehydrate them, right? So what you end up getting is a real smoky flavor. And we came out with a ton of flavors. So we have a sea salt cracked black pepper. Uh, we have a hickory smokehouse, you know, uh, habanero barbecue, a mustard maple, uh, and a teriyaki ginger. So there's five SKUs. You can find them on our website at eat the change uh, and order some if you'd like, but you know, I think what we're doing is really bringing mushrooms mainstream, although we're using not the most exotic mushrooms, right? we're using the Carminis and the Portobellos, but at least we're showcasing the, how, how much they are a blank can canvas for flavor. They take on, they're kind of a little bit of a sponge sometimes, right? Especially mm -hmm. when you break that cell wall, they release all that water and now they're ready to like soak up flavor, right? And that's like, that's been one of the, the most rewarding things through this process for me. It's just like, how unbelievable the structure of water is. Like, I can't believe like a raw mushroom holds that much moisture. The, like it leaves, it goes when you dehydrate it and then it could plump back up with, with all sorts of, it's just weird how that, and it's still, you know, it's not broken, it's not shattered. So it, they're unbelievable to cook with and it's been a lot of fun launching this, this jerky. So I'm definitely need to get you some and those listening, please, please try it out. Yeah, man. I think and those, get a sweatshirt. Those, like, 
Guys, <laughs> I want a sweatshirt <laughs> and eating mushroom jerky at the same time. <laughs> nice. Well, learning about mushroom cultivation through our course. Right. Okay, well, I'm totally. flex it out. <laughs> so I actually think those like stuff like you're making like mushroom jerky and a burger restaurant with like focus on making these foods more accessible is so essential, right? So especially people that want to maybe reduce like their meat intake um, in general is like, it makes so much sense to have something as a snack available as well. And to go back a little bit on this idea of like why mushrooms are sustainable, right? Because even in places where there's so much monoculture happening, they are a great tool to deal with the waste product of monoculture, right? So we grow most of our oyster mushrooms on the, the corn cob. So they, they harvest the corn, like uh, the kernels out of them. And then we use the cob to grow mushrooms out of them. And then we give it to the worms that then turns into really good compost, you know? So there's an extra layer of the process where you actually get a lot more food out of it. And I, I really see that this is where mainly oyster mushrooms come in, um, but there's some like lots and lots of different other mushrooms that I can take up, like the, the waste that process. Like you can grow a ridiculous amount of mushrooms on just the shell of the coconut, coconut co core. You can grow sacred mushrooms. I've grown reishi, I've grown oysters, I've grown king oysters. Like, I, it seems that every mushroom just enjoys growing this. I've grown chestnuts from them too. So, um, like this Tell waste Tell me about product. the corn cobs. So, you have the corn cob. Yeah. And then, and then how, is you, what, you put spore, like how does that work? Okay, so with what the method that we use is we use a, a lime pasteurization. So you use lime or call, like they call it here, which I think well, it raises the acidity um, to like a pH of 13. Um, and this pasteurizes the corn cob, so it kills about 80% of the organisms that are living on there. And not, this doesn't work for all mushrooms, but oyster mushrooms are really adaptable and they can withstand this high uh, acidic environment. And after pasteurization, you can inoculate with grain spawn. So you, the, basically the process of mushroom cultivation is you have a spore, uh, then you inoculate, like introduce the spore to, the, uh, to an agar petri dish or yeah. straight to, yeah. to grains. Then the mycelium grows and then you, you give it to either grains or a liquid culture. If you want to mm. go in mass production, most people are working with liquid culture these days. And then you make the mycelium eat all the grains in either a jar or a bag. And then you have this big clump of like beautiful mushroom mycelium, which if you shake, like break up the, uh, the bag or the jar, it has, it has all these loose little kernels that are filled with mushroom mycelium. Then you give that to a, the, the main food source, or you can give it to more grain. You can go anywhere from that stage too. But the main thing is like, you can, you can order this spawn online if you want to start off and you can like hot water pasteurize is another form of pasteurization, some straw or some wood chips, and you can put it in a bucket. And then the whole bucket will be colonized with mushroom, oyster mushroom mycelium, and then mushrooms will grow from there. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. So I did the, I did some, I did the method I guess what they were calling it is the lasagna method on, on the videos I was watching, but it was, I bought hay and I did it with the, the spores and I just watered and hay and watered and hay and watered and hay. Oh, wow, straw. It wasn't hay. It wasn't hay. It was straw, right? Straw. I think most people's straw hay is a little nutritious. Straw. Not, not, yeah. not hay. It was straw. It was straw. Exactly. So there's actually lots of ways, you know, oyster mushrooms. There's a lot of people in cities that grow oyster mushrooms exclusively on spent coffee grounds. So a really good reason why this is because if you brew coffee with a machine, you pasteurize the coffee grounds. If you inoculate the, the, the grounds the same day, they're going to grow oyster mushrooms. And especially really? in, yeah, for sure. And especially in like a, a more urban environment, this is such a good way to grow local mushrooms in a city. And there's even a project that's happening in, um, I think it's Nijmegen, a city in the Netherlands where uh, they have like a, a coffee like shop which is super popular. Everybody gets their coffee there. Then there's a beer brewer and they have all these spent beer grains that you can then use to grow mushrooms. And then in the center is the mushroom cultivation farm. So they use the spent coffee grounds. They use the, the, the beer, spent beer grains and nothing has to move. And they just grow like wow. oyster mushrooms without wow, ever having I'm to leave that. the building. I'm into yeah. that place. For That's sure. So and cool. I, I really so see cool. those like those collaborations of like maybe even a restaurant right you have a lot of compost okay what can you do with that compost uh, can we like somehow grow oyster mushrooms from the compost or like yeah there's so what do you do with your coffee grounds and like, like that's why sometimes like that this idea of like what you're saying like the wet markers or something in 
the, in Asia or Vietnam, where everything is centralized. And then if we can have like the centralized markets, the centralized restaurants, and then a centralized waste stream that is actually creating more stuff to sell at these markets. I think that's like the future of how we Listen, can build cities. I love that. And, and maybe we have a mushroom token that we, we launch. Yeah, for sure. Right? A, a crypto, a crypto micro, the micro token. Yeah. Someone's doing it. Someone heard it now and is doing it as we speak. Exactly. <laughs> but there's something that we're kind of working on in this really tiny town that we live in in, in Guatemala, where there's where, like we have a bunch of permaculture farms and like other organizations. We're kind of uh, have been talking about like implementing just a local coin. So we were like working just from within, and like it's really nice to have like a barter economy. But then sometimes it's also nice, especially if you do something a little bit bigger, to get rewarded through this and like currency has always been a great invention right makes lots of things easier so like an amateur hat maker you sell one hat like how much food can you ever get from that we need currency to reward people that can be specialists right and i think Absolutely. localized tokens that are out of the banking system are in many ways permaculture too absolutely absolutely so so in um so most of the mushrooms you're growing are indoors correct uh, actually, right now is the rainy season, so we have reishi growing outside, we have turkey tail growing outside, we have oyster mushrooms growing outside, we have some shiitake growing outside. It's shiitake, it's a little hot for shiitake, so it's not very happy here, but there's some, some individuals that still uh, like the fruit. Um, those are the big four, and yeah, those are the big four that we're cultivating right now. I like it, I like it. I feel like yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm behind on my mushroom growing season right now, I need to, I need to get in there. We didn't have yeah. such a good morale season over here in the Virginia area. We usually have a better one, but that, that, it didn't really happen this year. No, it was pretty. I heard it as well uh, from my East Coast forager friends that uh, the season this year was kind of dry, unfortunately. And like morels are, for example, we only recently learned how to cultivate them, but they're very p picky. But most yeah. of the the prime like mushrooms that you can forage are actually not cultivatable. Like all the Belize, they're ectomycorrhizae. They need there, there are three allies, uh, like chanterelles, you cannot cultivate them yet. Like I, I, I see a future of like past like food forests where we introduce ectomycorrhizae and then over generations, there is actually, we know that during the season, that's a way of cultivating these, these mushrooms. But you, you cannot grow them out of a bag, like um, for example, oyster mushrooms. Basically the only mushrooms that we're growing out, like cultivating are saffrophytes, so they eat dead matter. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and most Love of them it. are wood simplifieds. Yeah, for sure. It's like it's it's such a good cool practice because I don't know. You're fairly close. You have a restaurant in New New York. I don't know if you're familiar with small holds. Oh man, it sounds so familiar. But do they grow like they make these grow rooms that you can put in like in your restaurant or in your oh, store? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then yeah, they replace yeah. them with bags, so you always you can like give people like freshly harvested mushrooms from your own restaurant. And I think. Because it's so easy to grow these mushrooms anywhere. You know, I have a bunch of mushrooms growing in my shower because it's nice and humid in there. <laughs> <laughs> and it just makes total sense. And I can just like pick them, like shower, pick my mushrooms, and then have breakfast. Take a little it's snack. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, like I really see the future of like having all those spaces with less, less travel. And is this something that you've thought about before in your own restaurants to grow mushrooms in your own restaurants? I have, um, I mean, I was, um, um, I gave up my, let's say my sit down, fine dining restaurants uh, about three, four years ago and mm -hmm. I'm more of my fast casual restaurants and growing brands kind of thing. So I don't really, you know, I don't have that one restaurant where I, I check in every day. I used to have like, you know, on my, my bistro, I had a rooftop farm and I, I did all that kind of stuff. Um, but I am interested, uh, in, doing a mushroom farm, like an indoor, mm -hmm. you know, I'm talking with a buddy. I have some piece of, uh, you know, we have some land here in, in, uh, in Maryland by in Poolsville, which would be a great, perfect place for it. So we're starting to like, you know, we're starting to learn a little bit more and see, see that. So that's kind of what I would do. And I'd rather, I'd rather, um, you know, the, the big ideas here is like, you know, 
maybe grown mushrooms uh, in Virginia. I, I want to name it like so, something around spike, right? Because spike is a term in, in mushroom growth, right? And, and uh, it fits well. And then I'd love to be able to use my network of chefs and sell the mushrooms I'm growing uh, at, to the restaurant. So let that, I thought that would be cool. You know, like instead of being on the other side of it, I want to be on the, on, on the growing side and, and uh, you know, hopefully – I'll I'll grow some delicious you know mushrooms and and uh, be able to sell them at farmers markets and kitchens. So, such a good plan. I what I would uh, encourage you experimenting with is mm -hmm. looking how flavor profiles develop if you add different substrates. For example, right now there's some people that are experimenting with adding plants that are very high in the methyltryptamine to their substrate for legally grown psilocybin mushrooms in, for example, Jamaica, and they see an increase in psilocybin and psilocin. And this must also be with medicinal mushrooms and like edible mushrooms. Mm. Um, so I've been like, uh, like right now we finally have our mushroom prediction going that we have some more uh, time and like, uh, yeah, room because we have enough mushrooms to eat. Okay, now it's time to experiment. And I'm really curious to see what additions actually enhance a certain fa flavor profiles. I, so I think we, I'd love that. I love that idea. Are, so are you growing medicinal mushrooms and culinary mushrooms and psychedelic mushrooms? Uh, so we're not growing psychedelic mushrooms. No, we never. teach people okay. how to grow them. Okay. Um, but we do grow medicinal and edible mushrooms. Yeah. Okay. And, and what are your favorite medicinal mushrooms? My favorite medicinal mushrooms are reishi, the cordyceps, reishi. and lion's mane. And lion's mane, we have... We just got a really good culture, so I'm fingers crossed. But again, lion's mane likes colder climates, right? And the colder it gets here is like 20, 25 degrees Celsius. So it's, it doesn't have the prime way to pin. Uh, I've recently started experimenting with cold shocking them in a fridge. So I have this massive fridge, and I put the bags in, and then, oh, it's cold. So it's time for the mushrooms to grow. That's kind of my yeah, idea on yeah. that day, uh, experience. But yeah, I've like, um, you, I've also grown for mushrooms. Sorry? You're cooking with the lion's manes also? Yeah, 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 for sure. Like we've not successfully cultivated a large batch yet. We've I've grown like one that this this size. Um, yeah. Because it's not like it's native environment. They need like climate controlled rooms. Yeah. Um, but I think on our channel, Karina actually just posted a recipe of like a crabless cra a crab cake with lion's mane, which is one of the the famous things. Oh yeah, things crab cake. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I I heard that one a lot. So the. Um... I really think lion's mane is one of the most versatile for replacing like uh, seafood kind of dishes. Totally. It's, it's more fishy because of the texture, right? It's like, I, like I, I actually think the texture is more reptilian, but more people are used to fish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I never got the fishy thing out of that the lion's mane. I mean, I, I get the idea of shredding it like crab for a crab cake. So I get that. But but just on itself, it didn't, it ever really, I, I never got that texture. I, I think you're a little bit more right. It's a little bit more flaky, like a reptilian or something like that. So, yeah, I just make, it's like that, the, the, the texture is what it's all about. I think that's the same with chicken, right? If, if people think like, well, it tastes like chicken, it's because the texture is, is like, uh, is like chicken. Well, but maybe like, because you're in DC, right? And DC just decriminalized uh, all, all psychedelics. And I, I grew a lot of philosophies in, uh, in the Netherlands where it's legal. And I actually had a friend who would make dishes with like cooking uh, the, the sacred mushrooms. And actually, um, if, I was surprised that even with the heat, it wouldn't degrade the effect. And is this something that you see potentially in the future, most optimistic future, we have legal psilocybin mushrooms everywhere, that there's like people that would do like I mean, dishes with the eat, sacred mushrooms. Eat a delicious pack of this and take a journey. Why not? I think, I yeah. think anything, I think, I think any, Anything is, is possible. I mean, you know, it is legal here in, in the D.C. area and a lot of research is coming out. So it's exciting to see see all of it. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely uh, for it and, and want to be part of it. So so, um, you know, uh, again, it, I, I just I, I find them very magical in many different ways. So. So, yeah. Beautiful. Nice. Well, if they're, if they're almost already talking for an hour, it, it, it just flew by. Uh, I really enjoyed this conversation. It's like yeah. completely different. You have to than promise me before. we're going to do another one. We have to do another one of these. Okay. Right? Let's do it. Yes. Because after okay. I get you my jerky and you taste it, then, then, then we just we should hit up another one. Uh, okay. Uh, what about, okay, I might be in the States in August and even close to the East Coast. 
how come is it the the planet burger restaurant oh my, and then oh we'll my do a, oh my gosh 100% face to face, face, to face thing face to face we will host you at planet burger and the office i i, will, so, I, I also want to take you out to the farm over here and and, and talk with my, my my boys over there so that would be fantastic you let you let us know when and and we'll make it happen and we'll bring wow. you we'll bring all your fans along as well we'll we'll figure fantastic. it out <laughs> it sounds great man Is there anything else you want to share with all the lovely people that have stuck with us for an hour? No, you know, it's just, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's refreshing to have such a nice conversation with you. You know, I, I feel like, uh, especially in the last year, year and a half, two years, it's been crazy. Uh, life has been very challenging for a lot of people. And, and it's, mm -hmm. um, it's nice to, to get on, on a call with someone like yourself that's super knowledgeable about mushrooms and loves it and you see your passion for it. So So thanks for bringing that to the the people and to the world because it's 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 much needed. It's a, it's a, it's a, you know we need a lot of that, and uh, yeah, I mean check out our mushroom jerky. Uh, you know again it's eatthechange.com if you want to check it out. And if you happen to be in the DMV area or Philadelphia, you could find a Planet Burger. Just kind of check out the store locator and get this mushroom fungi sandwich is what we called it. It's a chicken fungi mushroom sandwich. It's absolutely delicious and good for you. So. Um, Yeah, and I'm going to order one of those sweatshirts. I'm not lying. Next time you see me, I'm going to be wearing one. Those are awesome. cool. Man, I had so much fun, Spike. Uh, I can't wait to see what you guys are, like, promoting more. And I also want to thank you for your work. A lot of people need to eat more mushrooms, you know. And yes. they, they need somebody to show them that they can be delicious. Yes. And, uh, well, wait. I just, got, I just got started. We have, like, these primordial soups that we're, gonna, we're launching here, which are dehydrated mushrooms, like cup of noodles. But it's just mushrooms, and you reheat them. These shiitake bacons I've been making. Uh, we're gonna have a lot of fun. We're, I'm in my test kitchen right now. That's why you see all the spices yeah. and solutions and stuff like that. I But, actually have an idea. I'm gonna send you an email after. I have a really cool idea that I want to run by you. And maybe that's, that's not a thing. But I'm, I gotta run. Thanks again. So much love, brother. And uh, take it easy. So much love. Ciao. Have a good